All right. Uh, for our next talk, we have Marvin Beckers from Kubernetes, who's going to talk to us about how we can run a Go debugger as an ephemeral container in Kubernetes. So, welcome, Marvin. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had their favorite beverage of choice that brings them through the day. Um, um, so let's get started on the Sunday. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about ephemeral containers, and in specific, I want to talk about sp specific use case for them that not everyone might be aware of, and I think it's quite nifty. So let's take a look if you agree with me. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I already got introduced, so I am a senior software engineer at Kubernetes. Um, and if you want to reach out to me afterwards, you can find me on GitHub or the Kubernetes community Slack as Ambic. Um, so yeah, let's take a quick look. Um, so we're going to talk about some basics. Uh, so we're going to talk about ephemeral containers as a concept. We're going to talk about Go debugging as a concept, and then kind of an extension to that remote debugging. Um, and after that, we're going to put all the pieces together, and we're going to have like kind of a working scenario, prototype, workflow, whatever you want to call it, and uh, that will end in a short live demo. And I wasn't aware there was a live demo before mine, so I hope that didn't like use all the luck. Uh, so fingers crossed, this one will work too. OK, um, first of all, let's talk about ephemeral containers, uh, because um, they are quite a recent introduction to Kubernetes, and maybe you have heard of it, maybe you haven't. Was that me? I don't know. Um, uh, so as a kind of a reminder, um, how it is in Kubernetes, um, a pod is kind of an immutable unit. That means the containers you have, well, once you have created a pod, you can change them. Uh, what's in your container is the definition of what will be launched as a one single unit. Okay. Um, so that changed a bit with Kubernetes 1.25. Well, that's not fixing the right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so let's continue. Um, so with Kubernetes 1.25, the feature ephemeral containers reach GA, so it's available to everyone, and it changes the whole ecosystem or the, the whole situation a bit because now you can launch, well, as they're called, ephemeral containers into your running pods. And that is a huge change from what we've seen before because, as, again, once you create a pod, you can change its container um, and what it's supposed to run. Uh, unless you like go into the container runtime and mess with it, but let's not talk about that. Um, so yeah, this changed. Um, this allows us to launch ephemeral containers um, that run alongside our main containers on the same node. So it's also part of the kind of pod unit that gets scheduled. Um, let's take a quick look at the implementation because if you're writing Go code, this might be interesting to you. Um, so ephemeral containers are implemented as a spec field on your pod spec. Uh, however, they are hidden behind a sub-resource. And if you ever wrote a, if you ever wrote a, uh, control, a, a Kubernetes controller, you might have dealt with updating a status sub-resource before. Um, and yeah, there's a special API endpoint that you need to call, and it's like called ephemeral containers, um, and using that you will be able to update um, and to add ephemeral containers. Um, and you can see here there's a short code snippet here from the client Go implementation, so just be aware if you use it, um, yeah, you need to call like special code. So now we've like kind of established, okay, ephemeral containers, that's something that can launch into existing pods. 
Um, but how do I do that? Because I just talked about the Go implementation, but I assume you don't run, want to write a tool or like a command line Go application every time you want to uh, launch an ephemeral container. So let's take a look at what's already available in the ecosystem. Um, and that is ma mainly kubectl debug. Um, kubectl debug is kind of a very nifty toolbox to troubleshoot all kinds of issues within Kubernetes. Um, and one of its features, and it's not the only one, so there are other features, is launching an ephemeral container into a pod. So that's the good news. And I can quickly show you um, kind of how this works in action, because here we have kind of the syntax to launch an ephemeral container. Um, you target a specific pod, so that's the pod placeholder. You choose an image. Um, ideally, you also, like, like in this case, I want to open an interactive shell. And I also want to target a specific container. And this is a very interesting feature in ephemeral containers because it allows you to kind of break down the isolation between different containers in a pod. And why is that useful? Um, well, I can show you a practical example. So in this situation, I launched an ephemeral container into my main application pod, and I targeted the main application container. And now, um, when I just look at the processes I have access to, you will see there's a bin app, and I didn't launch that from my ephemeral container. It's the application running within um, the, other, uh, the other container, which is my main application. So now I have access to, like kind of, I, I, I broke through some like container isolation, in this case on purpose, because that's what I want. I want my debugging application or whatever, like my debugging uh, routine, I want that to have access to uh, the main application that I'm trying to troubleshoot. So that's what kubectl debug already offers. Um, however, um, you can configure all the uh, container options on it. And we look at that um, or, and why that is important later on. But for now, um, let's just uh, look at um, something that I quickly wrote, quickly hacked together. It's not pretty, but it works for this talk. And that is a simple kubectl plugin called kubectl ephemeral. And this allows us to do something very similar to what kubectl debug already offers, and something that kubectl debug probably is going to implement in the future, or at least in a similar way. Um, but I can target a specific pod. I can pass a YAML file here, and that is the difference to what kubectl debugs offers at the moment, because while it's less ergonomic to hack together a YAML file, and we'll look at an example later, um, it will allow me to give it all the options that I want. Um, so this is kind of a workaround for getting, um, getting to the target state that I want, um, and this is something that we're just going to use later. Um, so yeah. If you just want to use ephemeral containers, go with kubectl debug. Um, I'm not endorsing this kind of hacky project in any way, uh, but it's just I, I needed it for the talk, so you know. Okay, so that was our first building block. So that was ephemeral containers. So let, let's now move on to the second one, and that is debugging Go applications. Um, because, well, <laughs> Oftentimes you, I don't know, you add a logging line uh, to your application, and that is kind of a basic way to debug your application. If you want to get more fancy, um, you use Delph. Uh, Delph is, I would say, the kind of, yeah, uh, standard or de facto standard uh, Go debugger. So it's also mentioned in the Go documentation, and it's a really nice tool because it allows us to, um, to well, debug Go applications. Um, and it has a fairly typical feature set. Um, so when you think of a debugger, you probably often need something that allows you to set breakpoints to investigate your application state when it hits such a breakpoint. And Delph offers that kind of feature. You can inspect variables when you hit a breakpoint. Um, you can also set conditions on breakpoints so you don't break on every um, occurrence because breakpoints are usually like a specific code line in your application. Um, so yeah, that is what Delph brings to the table, and it's a highly useful tool. If you haven't introduced it into your workflow, I would just highly recommend try it out. Um, it helps a lot. 
Now, we need to tell, tell uh, sorry, uh, we need to talk about something um, because Delve has two ways to debug your application. One of them is you just point it to your code and your code gets compiled by Delve and then executed. And that produces a debugging binary that already has all sorts of options set that allow you to, um, well, to, to do, uh, okay, uh, that allow you to, like, that allows Delve to properly debug your application. Now Delve has another mode, and that is attaching to an already running application. So you have a process on your system, that process is running a Go application, and Delve allows you to attach to that. Um, so it, like, it takes control of the already running process. And this is quite useful, we are gonna use that later, but we need to have kind of um, preparations for that in place. And that preparation, or these preparations, are a few compile flags that we want to set when building our Go application. Um, and that's the dash capital N and the dash L um, passed to the GC flags on Go build. Um, so, a bit of a complex syntax, but yeah, you hopefully get the gist from the example. And this is important because it will disable the optimizations done by the Go compiler. So usually you want those, of course. Um, this is something that usually um, you shouldn't disable. <laughs> In this specific case, though, it will, um, like if you don't set them, we cannot debug our uh, application properly. So if you have like a build, for example, in a Docker file, um, then the recommendation here to kind of get into the whole workflow that I'm presenting is to set these flags and that will, will allow the application to be compiled without optimizations and that in turn will allow Delve to attach to it later. Okay, um, so we add two of three building blocks um, and I'm faster than I thought, that's great. Um, so the last building block that I want to introduce is remote debugging. Um, and remote debugging is something that um, is really interesting because um, Delph, as you just saw, it's a, it's a quite nice tool. It has a command line, like an interactive shell prompt when you work with it, when you debug an application. Um, but sometimes that is, um, well, it, it's, it, it can be pretty far away from your development tools, depending on how you work. Um, and remote debugging is mostly facilitated through something that is called debug adapter protocol, or DAP, DAP, honestly, I have no clue. <laughs> um, but essentially, the idea between, uh, behind this protocol, it's a wire protocol, and it allows an IDE to talk to something that is called a debug adapter. And debug adapter, according to the whole proposal and the whole idea behind um, DIP, is that it's separate from the actual debugger, or at least it can be separate from the um, actual debugger. So that means it's kind of a shim layer between the debugger and its specific implementation, and an IDE that has a generic implementation for debugging. Um, so if you've done debugging in a Visual Studio Code, for example, um, then that frequently uses DAP and the UI kind of has a generic implementation for different programming languages. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so now, um, Delph actually supports this protocol. So this is something that goes like beyond actually what DAP suggests. Delph itself has DAP implemented. So you can start a DAP server with Delph, um, and the whole process is kind of like I'm trying to, to show here um, how you can like go across network boundaries. Because you have a running application process, um, you have the, deal, the Delph binary, the, the Delph process that is attaching to that application and starts debugging it, and then you have Delph connect. And this connection is, well, a network connection. It's connecting to a certain port um, where you expose the DAP server. So that means, for example, if you tunnel that um, from a remote system to your local system, you can cross network boundaries and you can debug your application like as if you were on the local system while, I don't know, your system is running somewhere. <laughs> um, 
And there are always like a few uh, snippets hidden here and there. And for example, here, uh, Delve has a few arguments that um, allow us to start such a server. And there's a, yeah, we need to tell it where to listen, and we need to tell it, okay, I want a headless debugging session. So I want a client that connects later to my, uh, to my debug server that I just opened. One interesting t uh, bit here is that um, on this port, there are two protocol implementations listening. So one is DAP, so the standard um, that came out of Visual Studio Code. And um, the other one is a Delve homegrown JSON RPC protocol. Um, both work, and when you run De Delve Connect, it actually uses the JSON RPC um, protocol. Uh, but yeah, if you use a client that uses DAP, um, that can talk the same protocol, or, or no, sorry, that can talk a different protocol on the same port. Okay. So we have three components now that we want to build together for this workflow. So we had ephemeral containers, so that means we can launch something into an existing pod, um, and that will help us, okay, I have the specific instance of my application that might be here, behave weird, um, and I want to debug that. Um, we have the second component, which is a Go debugger, so we know, okay, um, I have a, well, I have a Go application, so that means I can debug my Go application with Delve. And of course, this is kind of the um, component that you can switch out. So if, if you're working in a different programming language and you have a different debugger, then kind of the whole situation works by replacing Delve with something that works for you. And the third component is the remote debugging, and that will allow us to use a generic protocol to debug essentially anything as long it has as it lo a long, as long as it has a debug adapter protocol implementation. So that's kind of the important bit. If that is a debug adapter or the debugger itself, that depends on your on your specific situation. So now let's put everything together. So let's run Delve as an ephemeral container. Um, and this is where we take a step back to the kubectl ephemeral plugin that I told you about. Um, and this is what I want to pass to it. I told you you can pass a YAML file, and that YAML file can have essentially all options that a container hidden inside a pod spec has. And in this specific case, um, the later part, the commands, um, that might be something that you're not really um, surprised about. Uh, because, well, it's the DLF attached command with a few options. It opens up um, the, uh, the, the remote, uh, the DAP server. Um, it allows the headless mode. Um, and now there's one thing here that is interesting, or that's important. I talked about kind of crossing container boundaries before, and this is another situation where we also need to traverse some security measurements in place by default in Kubernetes. Um, because, well, Delve attaches to a running process, and that is quite a, <laughs> that's quite an operation, let's put it that way, and usually you don't want processes to interfere with each other, so there are numerous uh, security, mm, well, security uh, limitations in place usually, and this is kind of where um, this situation um, might not work on your production cluster because maybe you have tight policies in place, um, but the security context needs to set the privileged flag or the privileged option. And this is quite important because otherwise Delve does not have the necessary permissions on a very kind of low level uh, to attach to a running process, so this will not work. And I showed you earlier that we had the um, application process um, running with, like, in the PS uh, output. And this is also something important because here um, you can see like the last line, you see um, the PID that we're attaching to. And uh, this only works, of course, if your application started, through, started that binary as its kind of entry point when it started the container. Um, because that is PID 1 within that container. If it's a different PID, this might be more difficult. So if there's something in the container that launches um, the main application, then figuring out the PID might be dynamic and might be more complicated. 
And this is kind of a visualization of what we want to achieve in the end. So we have our example app here on the right side. Um, we have a Delve ephemeral container, and that container is attached to our running application. And because we don't want to expose the ephemeral container port um, for, for Delve, for the DIP implementation, um, and you can't really do that with ephemeral containers anyway, we are tunneling into the port with kubectl port forward. So we're opening a local port to forward to that remote port. And once you've done that, um, it looks like Delve is running on your local system. So you can just use Delve Connect or whatever other tool you have. Um, and yeah, that will allow you to connect and will allow you to debug your application while running in a Kubernetes cluster, and that's potentially very far away from you. But it will mostly, like, let's uh, assume the network latency isn't too bad, but this will mostly feel like, like local debugging. And one last step, because um, I talked about Visual Studio Code a bit earlier, um, so DIP mostly came out of that um, to kind of bridge the gap between different uh, debuggers. And uh, well, that means we can use our implement or our workflow that we've built so far and use it in the editor of our choice. Like uh, imagine a little asterisk there. So every, like any implementation, any IDE or any editor that supports DAP can potentially help you here integrating this into your code workflow. Um, and for that, you need a specific config file, at least for Visual Studio Code. It might be different for other implementations, but Visual Studio Code allows you to um, configure default debug, uh, sorry, a custom debugging options. Um, and this is on a per workspace level. Um, and there's this well, file that is called launch.json. And there are a few interesting options that we need to pass. Um, one is the uh, port and host, where our DIP server is listening, and because we are tunneling that into localhost, um, well, um, that's where we need to point Visual Studio Code to. It doesn't know about the network tunnel that we've established. Um, and another interesting part here is the substitute path option. This is something for Go specific, because Go by default compiles like the whole file path into the binary, um, and we're using that kind of path to set the debug, uh, sorry, the breakpoints. Uh, we need to teach Visual Studio Code that the environment that the Go application was built in looks different um, from what we have on our local system. So essentially, we're changing workspace folder, um, and this is a variable here that uh, Visual Studio Code will replace for you to, um, well, the folder that your application was built in. And in this specific case, it was slash build. Um, we can take a quick look at the Docker file that I used. Um, and there, like, kind of everything comes together. You can see that there's this work dear build. Um, I copied all my Go code into that, and then I passed the uh, flags that I talked about earlier um, to build the application, and then I copied it um, from that stage into, like, the actual, um, the actual container image. Uh, but it's important to note that um, the folder is, rel is, is important um, where you build. So it's not where the binary ends are, but it's where the application was built. And we're gonna look at this a bit, uh, a bit um, in a bit in the uh, actual live demo, but you know, in case it doesn't work, I just wanted to have a screenshot here uh, to prove it. Um, so this is essentially Visual Studio Code that ran into a, uh, in, into a breakpoint. You can see that, okay, I have my code, um, I hit this breakpoint, and I can inspect my variables. And this is actually connected to that local debugging session. So this is running in whatever Kubernetes cluster you would like, but for me as a developer, it looks like I'm debugging my local code. Um, and as I said earlier, it doesn't need to be Visual Studio Code if you're not a huge fan of that. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm personally more of a NeoVim guy, um, and I have a quick screenshot here from uh, NeoVim with a few plugins that also speak DAP. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is kind of like the same UI you just saw, but it's running my terminal, and I don't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's essentially our target state that we want to get to. And now, 
before we go into a live demo, I just wanted to quickly um, show you there is a repository um, that you can access via this QR code. Um, it's like a companion repository. It, com like, it has the slides, a few information about this, like the sample application that I'm going to show you later. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, um, take a look there. It's available on my GitHub profile. Okay. And now, let's jump into the quick live demo. Um, let me w knock on wood. Um, and it's the other way around. Okay, so um, I have a Kubernetes cluster that I am connected to. I have a sample application running here, which is a, sample, a simple web server. Um, usually this would probably be exposed um, through like an ingress or a gateway. <laughs> um, in this specific case, this Kubernetes cluster is running on my local machine. Um, so yeah, I don't need that really because I can, there, there isn't really like a load balancer implementation or something. So we're gonna just get a fresh pot because we wanna make sure that nothing has tampered with this. So we're gonna make a new pot appear. And we actually need to go into this folder. Um, so I have a pod here running, and what I want to do now is I want to use, and I'm just going to spell it right out, so kubectl ephemeral. I want to pass it uh, the, the pod name, because that's where I want to launch my Delve container into. I I'm gonna pass the YAML file that you saw earlier. We can take a quick look at that again if you want. Um, so here is um, the Delph, uh, uh, Delph YAML file um, that I showed you, um, and we're gonna use that to launch our ephemeral container. Uh, so we're gonna do that. Here we go. And then we also want to break, uh, sorry, we want to break isolation between containers because we want to attach to the application. So we are going to target the sample app container inside the pod that is already running. And you can see it's a self-written tool. It doesn't get you. It doesn't give you any output. So uh, <laughs> um, let's let's check if this is actually working because we can take a look at the pod, and you will see that it just created a new container here. And that is my Delph ephemeral container. As you can see, okay, it tried to pull the image, it created the container, and it started it. So yeah, the ephemeral container is now running. Um, so the next step that we want to take is we want to port forward into it. And I need to get the name again, apparently. Do, 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 do. So here we go, and we're gonna tunnel the, uh, the DIP port that we just opened, and we're also gonna tunnel the application port because, well, again, we don't really have some, some way to interact from the outside. Okay, so the network tunnel is established, so now let's take a look at Visual Studio Code here, um, because that is my application code. Um, I am gonna run uh, the debug option here, and you can see that here the remote attach is available from the file that I showed you earlier, the launch.json. So we're gonna attach. We don't have a breakpoint yet. Um, so we're just gonna quickly go over here and curl the application. Oh, yes, thank you. And we get something back here, it's a string, it says bad override, so let's assume your application was more complex and you don't know what's going on. Um, so we go back, we set a breakpoint here because this is where the response is being written, and now the breakpoint is set, and now we're gonna curl this again, and we're back in Visual Studio Code, we hit the breakpoint, and we are now in the debugging session um, within this like kind of situation, within this breakpoint, and if I wanted to like play around with things, I could even override what is going here, what is going on in the variables. So I'm just gonna replace this with good overrides. And I'm going to continue. And you can see here, I changed the variable, something uh, different was returned. And yeah, that is our debugging session. And with that, 
I am done, so thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, have a great day. And maybe we have time for questions. I don't know if there are any. Is there a, is there a um, pathway forward without uh, security context privileged for this kind of remote debugging? Like, is there an idea on how this might work in, in future? Uh, so I was looking a bit at documentation. Um, and honestly, I think not because um, it uses features within the Linux kernel that are just that generally you don't want that to happen. Like, you don't want someone to be able to, like, kind of interject itself into your process. So I think per kind of design, and maybe Delft changes this in the future, but I would doubt that. So I don't think there would be a way to do that. Uh, I experimented with ephemeral containers in the past, and I got mixed results. Uh, Maybe, well, my, one of my thoughts was that uh, I was trying to debug, let's say, uh, Ubuntu container with uh, Alpine tools. So do you need to be cautious about that? Because uh, I'm not really clear how do they actually uh, merge uh, to each other. Um, pretty good question. I think that depends on the tools you want to use. Um, so in general, I mean, lots of the Linux primitives are the same across like Ubuntu or Alpine, but depending on the tools, you might see a mismatch, yeah. And in this specific case, it's a Go application, so it's like statically compiled or fairly statically compiled. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it, it's a valid concern, so you need to watch out for that. Yeah, just uh, to add that, uh, yes, uh, I guess Go helps a lot, because uh, let's say uh, the underlying uh, C library uh, in uh, Ubuntu and in Alpine are different, and uh, that possibly gave me that uh, strange yeah. results. Yeah, 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 no, that's true. And you saw maybe in my Docker file that I was using C go enabled set to zero, so I don't really have any dependency on the on the underlying Linux distribution. So yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> Uh, what's pretty impressive to see you like set up the tunnels and uh, starting the ephemeral container. Would there be any possibility to automate those steps from, for example, VS Code <coughs> with the debug script to like select uh, a pod and container and like do the starting of the ephemeral container and port forwarding all automatically to make it easier for the developer? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. You could you could script this or. Um, like I would, I would kind of suggest to use the stock tools that we have, so kubectl pod forward and that. I'm not sure you would want to re-implement that, but yeah, there could of course be a script that like takes a few options and runs through all the steps. That that would be for sure possible. Yeah. All right. Last question. Well, I was playing it with uh, Kubernetes 1.24, and at that time it was necessary to kill the running port after you actually use the ephemeral container, because we're, we're saying that it's not stable. And you mentioned 1.25, did the situation change, or you still need to destroy the port after the debugging session? Actually, good question, and that was my script, and I forgot to talk about it. Uh, so um, the ephemeral container, like, uh, it will not actually terminate on its own, you're right. Like, it, it shares the pod life cycle, so if you delete the pod, the ephemeral container will be gone too. But if you don't, like, if you let the pod running, the ephemeral container will also keep running. Um, so you can, like, either the ephemeral container terminates on its own because it, like, searched for debugging information, uploaded that, and was done. Um, or if you have a continuous process, like with the Delph attach that we're doing, you would need to kill that process, for example, by opening a shell into the ephemeral container and killing it or something. But yeah, it's a good point. This is, this is something that is still, um, still something that you need to do. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.